Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it's a joy and a privilege to be with you. My name is the Reverend Dr. Thomas Brower. Um, and if you've never heard of me or seen me before, that's perfectly reasonable. My family and I have just moved back to Canada from a 10 year absence. Um, and most recently, we've come from New Zealand. So greetings to you from Christchurch, New Zealand. Uh, we've only been back for two weeks. And the only reason why we're here at all is uh, because uh, Dr. Martin, no, Steve Martin, somebody I even know and can't get his name right. Uh, Steve Martin's, uh, a member of his family has the COVID and so they are shut down. And so Myron gave me a call and said, hey, you're lazy and doing nothing. <laughs> Would you mind pinch hitting uh, this morning? So I'm going to make one significant promise to you about the whole of this service, through the whole of this service. Good morning, Jim, it's a joy to see you. Um, and that promise is I will be making mistakes. <laughs> and so you are entirely entitled to let me know as to which mistakes I have made you can correct me, you can rewind me, you can do whatever you need, just please don't throw a chair. That uh, would be very kind if you wouldn't throw a chair. Now, they're usually too. <laughs> and, and we're doubly blessed in that most of the seating here are pews, which impossible to throw. So that's very good. Um, are there ordinarily an announcement of some form at this point beyond just that, no, no, this is now when I stop talking and introduce the music. Okay, so would you please join with us as we sing together, all creatures of our God and King.
just before we tuck into the formal prayers, as I know you know, as you look around uh, this church, you will see many of the rocks that Jim has collected uh, and placed uh, for us to have an encounter with the firm rock, our foundation of faith. Um, I would like to share with you this brief image, uh, or I would briefly like to share with you this image, and I'll, I'll hold it this way first if the cameras want to do something with that, uh, and then I will walk it down the aisle. But this is a photograph of two rocks in a flowing stream on uh, New Zealand's South Island, and the theme of the sermon today, and indeed the theme of every day of worship, is the presence of the Holy Spirit that leads us into Christ, and the way in which the Spirit of God moves and shapes us, moves and shapes the world, and has moved and shaped the rocks that are uh, around us even now. And this water, this powerful spirit that flows and shapes us, that is the spirit of God to which we are called to attend and privileged to have within us. And look, I've walked behind the cameras. Ha ha, I've escaped them. Um, and what I'd like to encourage you to do this morning is to hold in your heart as we pray the truth that the Spirit of God is here and is with you, alive with you, dwelling with you. And so with that knowledge, dear friends in Christ, as we prepare to worship Almighty God, let us with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Merci most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Gracious God, you have heard the prayers of your faithful people. You know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Grant our requests as may be best for us. This we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, open our lips, and mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. O oh, come, let us worship. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Alleluia. Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Alleluia. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, for since by a man death and death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. 
For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Alleluia. Let us hear the word of the Lord. The first reading is taken from Acts 11, verses 1 to 18. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of, the God, of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, By no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, then God has given even Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Hallelujah, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise Him in the heights, praise Him all you angels of sun and moon, praise Him all you shining stars, praise Him heaven of heavens, and you waters above the heavens, let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created, He made them stand fast forever.
second reading is from Revelation 21 verses 1 to 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said this, Write these words, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to Christ, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ.
holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Clothed in rainbows of living colors, flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Struck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, it's breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Service. 
was your foe Still you love fought for me You've been so, so good to me And I felt no love You paid it all for me You've been so, so I couldn't earn it I don't 
We welcome you, Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we thank you that you are here. We invite the Spirit of God and welcome the Spirit of God to come upon us, to sweep us clean. Let any negativity be taken away, every hurt bound and healed, every tear wiped, and let this be now, not only in that age to come, And Spirit of God, bless us and speak to us even as we extend your word, proclaim your word, and dwell upon your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for the music this morning. It's wonderful. Um, so the title that I have entitled this thing with a title is, Why Did You Go to Uncircumcised Men and Eat with Them? And I happened to have this open on the kitchen table this morning when my wife walked past and looked at it and said, You're going to talk about circumcision? No, I'm not. I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. Because in the story that we heard from Acts, in that passage that we heard from Acts, it's all about the Holy Spirit. But it's about the Holy Spirit in a context where we often, especially we Anglicans, are very good at imagining the Holy Spirit isn't at work at all. And that's in the deliberations and the debates How do we operate as a church and how do we run as the body of Christ? Our functions and our structures. And the debate that's happening or the discussion that's happening with Peter and those of the circumcision, as it says in the Greek, that is exactly the kind of debate that's happening. This is, it's not a synod, but it could be a really boisterous vestry meeting, right? or a general, a general meeting. What do you do, what's your annual meeting called? Just an annual general meeting? Oh, okay, that sounds very similar. Excellent, <laughs> is generally that. Um, so it could just be a, like an annual general meeting. It's an opportunity where, where <laughs> I know this isn't true at St. Paul's, but sometimes in some churches, there are a few people who are a bit more opinionated than the others. It's not true here. I know that, but it does happen, shocking as that is. And sometimes those slightly more opinionated people might every now and again try and say something to the rector or to the priest about maybe you're not doing things quite the right way. Not here, never with Myron, but sometimes that happens elsewhere. It never happened for me either in my previous charges, not once. Just in case anybody out there thought I was talking about someone in particular, I'm not. But in this debate, in this discussion, where the, the stroppy guys have called Peter out and said, why have you gone and done this? Peter does not argue. Not at all. Not once does he argue. Neither does he take offense. This is Peter, the rock, the first of the apostles, being called out. There's no pride here. There's no, how dare you talk to me this way. Not at all. Instead, all Peter does is tell the story of his experience when he is challenged. So let's take a minute. If you've got your uh, bulletins open to the Acts reading, it begins, as most chapters do, at verse one. And it says, now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So, so far, this is good. This is positive. 
So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, now all of this has followed, what's happening here has followed all of chapter 10. Chapter 11 almost always does follow chapter 10. And through chapter 10 is the discussion of Peter's encounter with Cornelius. And this is what the uncircumcised believers are having an issue with. It's the way in which Peter engaged Cornelius and his family. So, so when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers, now you have to think of circumcised believers in quotation marks. They're all Jewish, which means they're all cir circumcised at this point. So it's not just the Jewish believers, but it's the sect, that circumcision sect, that group of people that Paul spends so much effort in many of his letters arguing against. That's, this is the very beginning of that group of believers, of believers and followers of Jesus Christ who are insisting that in order to be saved, you must also be circumcised. It is necessary to be Jewish so that you can become Christian. And that's who we're talking about. The circumcised believers here are that group of people. And so they criticized Peter, saying, why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? They don't have an issue with the proclamation of the gospel. They don't have an issue with people accepting the story of Jesus Christ. They don't have an issue at all with any of that. What they have an issue with is you're a circumcised Jew and you're eating with a Gentile. That is an act that is unclean. You have brought uncleanness upon yourself. They're unclean, now so are you. That's the issue at work here. Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step. And he's not angry. He's not defensive. He's not responding with any kind of malice or haughtiness. And he simply tells the story. He begins first with that event where he's on Simon the Tanner's roof in Joppa. And he has the dream. Do you know the dream? We know the dream, the dream of the net being let down. And within the net, you have all these animals. And the animals are clean and unclean. And at the end of the, as the net is lowered down, he hears the voice from heaven saying, kill and eat. And Peter in the dream says, ah, ah. I'm paraphrasing, but says, ah, ah, I have never allowed an unclean thing to pass my lips. Right? And then the net goes up, and then it comes down, and then it goes up, and it comes down, and that pattern is repeated three times. It's a significant number. And then he wakes up. And just as he wakes up, there's a knocking at Simon the Tanner's door, and here are people sent by Cornelius. Now, do you remember who Cornelius is? A Roman centurion. Part of the Roman guard. He's really high ranked, isn't he? You know what's fascinating? In the retelling of this story, as Peter speaks what has happened, he doesn't mention Cornelius' name or his rank or his importance. This event has not happened because Cornelius is a high-ranked and important person. He has not been welcomed in some special way because he is a more special human being. This has happened because God made it happen, and that's all that's important. And as Peter goes to meet Cornelius and his household. He carries with him the last words of God spoken in his dream. What God has made clean, you must not call profane. What God has made clean, you must not call profane. In Peter's mind, 
is a lifetime of being taught and trained about the uncleanness of animals, the uncleanness of various circumstances of life, the uncleanness of other people, particularly the Gentiles, particularly the Romans and the Greeks. And God has spoken. What God has made clean, you must not call profane. Do not, as you go into this meeting, do not carry with you, the Lord is saying, do not carry with you the law that you believe to be in place. Do not carry with you the rules of separation. Do not carry with you that tendency, that temptation, that desire to push out the other. Because I, the Lord your God, have made them clean. And who are you to say otherwise? By your behavior, by your choices, by your actions. And the proof of this comes as Peter begins to speak to them. And the Spirit of God comes upon them. Now the word there, the, for message, that word is rema. And perhaps you've heard that word before. But the word rema is slightly different than the word logos when it comes to message. Rhema is that collection of words that is a message, whereas logos is that foundational meaning. And so what's being said here, and that's not just kind of academic nuance, but what's being said here by using the word rhema is that it is the speaking of the words of the gospel. The words themselves are powerful. The words themselves move people. The words themselves welcome the Holy Spirit. And as the words of the gospel are spoken out loud, the people who are hearing receive the Spirit of God. They are not circumcised. They are not even baptized. They have never heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ prior to this. And yet the Spirit of God comes upon them with power. And so much so that Peter even says, just as it was for us at the beginning, just as it was for us at Pentecost. Now, we haven't celebrated Pentecost yet, but this story is happening post-Pentecost. So just as it was for us at Pentecost, so the Spirit of God has come upon these people. And because he can see the work of the Holy Spirit, because the Spirit of God spoke to him in the dream, because the Spirit of God told him to go with those people, he says in verse 12, the Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. Don't treat them differently. And so he and six others went. And now because there are six others, there are witnesses to what has happened as well. And, and you've got Peter and the six all bearing witness to the presence and power of the Holy Spirit upon these Gentiles, upon these Romans against whom there's supposed to be no distinction. This is Peter's explanation, not defense, but his explanation when he's asked, why would you eat with the Gentiles? So because the Spirit of God said, make no distinction, and because the Spirit of God came upon them with power, and I saw that there was no distinction because the Spirit of God came on them in the same way he came on us. That's it, that's all. So how was I supposed to separate them? The other words that were in Peter's mind, he says in verse 16, and I remembered the word of the Lord how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
and that will be the mark and the sign. You see, baptism is a really important symbol. It is the sign and symbol of your separation from the defiling effects of the world. And if you're going to become a Jewish convert, if you are a non-Jewish person who's about to become Jewish, you would go through a ritual baptism. It would be the final sign and symbol that you are washed clean of your old life and you have entered into the new life, the true life under the true God. That is a Jewish practice that John was using to demonstrate the importance that we all need to be made clean. But how much cleaner are we? How much more is our old life separated? How much more are our old titles and our old ideas of self cut off when it is the Holy Spirit, that water of God, that washes over us and makes us clean? This is what Peter has in his mind, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the clearest, truest, fullest mark that God is with these people, has redeemed these people, has healed these people, and has brought them life. And so Peter makes the only possible conclusion If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? It's not up to me who's in and who's out. It's up to God. And God marks that by the presence of his spirit. And whatever other rules we might think there are, whatever other defining, distinguishing marks we think there might be, if the Spirit of God is there, who am I to say otherwise? Who am I to say that he isn't? And the response of those who had challenged him, I wish was always the response of the church. I wish it was always our desire, will, and capacity to respond as these people did. Because they set aside their politics. They set aside their preference. They set aside what they knew always to have been true and what must always therefore be true. They allowed that to be set aside. And together in verse 18, when they heard this, they were silenced. And they praised God. They were not themselves humiliated. They were not themselves scandalized. Even though they would have disagreed entirely with what Peter had done, they could not, des- they could not argue that the work of God was in play. And so instead of fighting, instead of storming off, they simply praised God. The Holy Spirit is at work. The Holy Spirit is moving. We have read prayers and we have sung songs that have talked about the new thing that God is doing. We're coming out of a long pandemic and by coming out, we're not actually out of it in any way, shape or form, but some of the burdens of it have been lifted. We don't know what God's new thing is going to be yet. We don't know what it's going to be like. We don't know what ideas and rhythms and patterns and laws we're going to have to give up yet. But we know this. We know absolutely. We know with certainty and without any hesitation The Spirit of God is moving. The Spirit of God is at work. And the Spirit of God is coming upon us, the church, the church in this world, to equip you, to strengthen you, so that there is no distinction between you and even the first disciples and apostles upon whom the Spirit of God came. 
so that you can carry this message that there is hope. That there is hope in this life and in the life to come. That there is a power greater than pandemics. That there is a power greater even than our own grief or sorrow. There is a power greater than our illness. There is a power greater than our sadness. There is a power greater than everything that would hold us back, that would trap us in, this is the way it needs to be. And all we need to do, we don't even need to be like the heroes of this story. All we need to do is to have the grace of the circumcision sect in this moment to be able to say, okay, I'll set aside what I thought was right because I see the Spirit of God is moving and is at work. And because of what God is doing, I will change my mind. I will change my choice. I will change my action. And I will welcome whatever God chooses to bring next. And here's another promise. That because whatever it is that comes will come by the hand of God, it will be good. It will be good for you it will be good for us. It will be good for the world. Now, do we have the courage to let the voice of God speak and lead us to the new thing? In Jesus' name, amen. Now let us stand together as we confess our faith in the words of the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. In joy and hope, let us pray to the source of all life, saying, hear us, Lord of glory. That our risen Savior may fill us with the joy of his holy and life-giving resur resurrection, let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. Remembering today those in our St. Paul's cycle of prayer, Lucas Masaryk and Ivy Gonda. Ranji Samuel and Patty Nickel, as well as all those in the Anglican cycle of prayer. We also pray, Lord, with thanks for Thomas and his words this morning. We thank you that your Holy Spirit is with us, and we pray your Holy Spirit upon the people at the church retreat, the, the rest of our congregation who are away, away there this weekend. We pray that you be with them. And we also pray that isolated and persecuted churches may find rest, sorry, may find fresh strength in the Easter gospel. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. That he may grant us humility to be subject to one another in Christian love. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory that he may provide for those who lack food, work, or shelter. Let us pray to the Lord. 
hear us, Lord of glory. That by his power, wars and famine may cease through all the earth. And specifically right now, Lord, we pray for the Ukraine. We pray for the Ukrainian people and, and just, we pray for Putin that he, his heart would be softened and that somehow you would speak to him, Lord. We pray your Holy Spirit upon that situation and pray for your peace in the Ukraine and Russia. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. That he may reveal the light of his presence to the sick, the weak, the dying, that they may be comforted and strengthened, let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. And that he may send the fire of the Holy Spirit upon his people, that we may bear faithful witness to his resurrection, let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. Amen. Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, is the way, the truth, and the life. Give us grace to love one another and walk in the ways of his commandments, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. except to say that we will be doing our annual spring cleaning coming soon at the end of May and at the beginning of June. So that's just going to work with, we have a sign-up sheet, but just come at some point during that week um, and uh, do your task. Please let the office or me know um, where, when you're going to be coming, if you're going to be coming. Um, and... Um, as well, in a couple weeks, we will be doing the service of confirmation. And uh, so if you're interested in that, please talk to Myron um, when they are back from the retreat. Um, and I think that's really every, oh, and next weekend, the youth will be going on their Young Sojourners retreat as well. So um, 
please keep them in your prayers as they travel and as they um, retreat away. And you can join us standing for our closing song. And can you have any better dismissal words than hallelujah, death is undone? There you go. That's it. Hallelujah, Jesus has won. Hallelujah. And hallelujah, we overcome. Hallelujah. Now, with the hallelujahs upon our lips, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.